Hey, good morning. My name is Larry Talley. I'm from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I'm also the strategist for DFW Normal. First, I want to just point something out, something very important. And that is that our country has wasted one and a half million dollars arresting, jailing, and killing its citizens with an increasingly militarized police force. We have essentially created a war to force a moral code of injustice on all Americans. The prohibition of marijuana has not only failed in its promises, but actually created additional and disturbing problems throughout our society. Repealing the prohibition of marijuana does not mean we endorse its use. That's important to impart to those people whom you're speaking to. It is a call for wiser law enforcement and public health policy. It's really that simple. Prohibition has given control of marijuana production and distribution to drug cartels and street gangs around the United States and abroad. Now this promotes disrespect for law and it reinforces ethnic and generational divides between the public and law enforcement. Now every year more than three quarters of a million Americans are arrested for marijuana possession. That's far more than all, arrested, all those arrested for violent crimes in America. That's important to note. The cost of marijuana prohibition exceeds $12 billion every year and it is a failing strategy. There's not more, I'm sorry, there's not less marijuana in the Republic of the United States. There's more. There's not less crime. There's more. The cost of government's not smaller, it's vastly greater. And the respect for law has not increased, but it's diminished over the years. Now we, as Americans, need to urge our leaders to support the passage of legislation to remove the penalties for the possession of marijuana and regulate its use, production, and sale, as is done with other substances, such as liquor. Now the prohibition of marijuana has kept liberty in the dark for many years. We're going to let it out and we're going to ring the bells of freedom. It's just a matter of time. So I ask you today, is prohibition working? Let me bring this over here to the right, to the left. <laughs> I ask you today, is prohibition actually working? We all know that it's not. It's a failing strategy. Again, I'm Larry Talley. I'm representing Drug Policy Forum of Texas, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and the uh, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth chapter of National Organization for the Reformation of Our Marijuana Laws. I retired from the Navy in 2007 and I moved out here to the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. After 21 years working in Naval Intelligence, Naval Special Forces, and serving my country, I, well, obviously I didn't use marijuana. I was actually involved in the drug war. I was one of the guys that were storming drug labs in South America. I lived in Central America. I lived in the Republic of Panama for many years where my daughter was born. And I deployed to different parts of Central and South America, believing, truly believing that we can roll, we could cut off the supply and we could make America drug free by 1995. Boy, I was ignorant. A lot of us were. A lot of us still believe that that's a possibility. We can make America drug free. Do you guys think we can make America drug free? Yeah. What happens if you were to just totally eliminate all the drugs in the United States? I mean, the supply of drugs into the United States. People will make drugs. They're going to make stuff. Right. That's just, it's, they huff gas. We have a drug problem in this country and we're attacking a supply. We should, be, we should be looking at regulation, taxation, and education. Just the three tier, that's what's worked with other substances. You know, I mean, in 1985, when I went to high school, in 1985 when I went to high school, I think it was like 42% of this country smoked. That's what I think is really, I love that. I love this little, this little analogy. 42% of this country smoked. I worked in Safeway in Border, Texas. And you know, when I, was, uh, when I wasn't bagging groceries, I was smoking a cigarette on the way out to deliver those groceries to their car. That's just the way that it was. And some, and some pay, well, in Border, Texas, you could stand in line in the grocery store and smoke a cigarette. Today, it's not like that, is it? It's not like that at all. Now, we've reduced America's addiction to cigarettes. No, I'm not, I'm not dissing anybody that uses tobacco. It's a free country. God bless you. But what we've done is we've reduced the addiction. And that's the key. We've reduced addiction, and we didn't shoot people to do it. I like, I like the analogy that Russ Belleville talked about yesterday. I, I really like that. It was very enjoyable. Thank you. And, and he talked about, pretty much alluded to the same thing, that we don't, you know, you don't have Winston and Marlboro shooting at, shooting at each other in downtown Dallas, and downtown Dallas isn't turning into a, you know, another war as. It's through taxation, regulation, and education. We can do the same thing with drugs, all around drugs. Well, let's talk about, we're here to talk about Texas. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds. I just want to talk a little bit about things that I've done in my career. You know, I was in the Navy for 21 years. While I was in the Navy, I did a lot of really cool stuff. But I also, I also was in some accidents. I was in a helicopter accident, broke my back. I say her injured my back very badly, went through some treatment. And, uh, and then I went on, because I'm an achiever, I went on to make the US Olympic run team after that. And uh, I got kicked out of this branch of service that I was doing really cool stuff in because they thought I was too broke. 
So I made the US Olympic run team. I didn't actually get to compete in the Olympics. I was a little old, it was in my 30s, I'm a marathonist. But you know, I, I did some really cool stuff. And yeah, I, oh, let me show you some cool pictures. There we go. So I, I race whippets. I have a whippet service dog. And you know, Terry Nelson was here. I'd point out that uh, this is the kind of stuff that we did. Flew stuff, flew people into South America, went and did riverine operations, trying to cut off the head of the cartels. We actually did. We, we, we got rid of the Cali and the Medellin cartels. We did a great job with that. And our goal was to basically cut off the, the head off of the cartels so that we could end that supply. But what happened was, is what we knew that was happening. It was that uh, they, they, it just got distributed. All that, the big pipelines of cocaine coming to the United States just got farmed out to thousands of little independent groups who then became extremely wealthy overnight. It just exploded. We, we lost the supply chain and it got distributed and then we had more drugs coming into the country. Every time we try to stop it, it just gets worse. This is when I lived in Panama. I'm gonna point out here, this is, this is a, I believe that's a Miraflores locks in the Panama Canal, kind of a pretty place. And if you keep on going to the other side of Panama, there's this area called a free zone. It's a free zone. It's the, the government has established this big area in Panama where drugs are kept and money's kept. It's really not designed for that. It's designed for goods and transshipment points. But I'll, I'll tell you, as I was being shown this particular area out in the free zone, I had a NIS agent telling me oh, about this, this much is coke, this much is marijuana, but the biggest biggest collection of trailers over there is just cold hard cash. Cold hard cash, they got more money than they know what to do with, so they store it in trailers. I'm not exaggerating, this is a fact. This is so much unregulated money in, in the world just sitting in these trailers, it could destabilize economies, right? Seven degrees to Kevin Bacon, I love to play seven degrees to the drug war, right? Yeah, seven degrees to the drug war, what ills in our society are, how, many, how far affected from the drug war? Our economy, one degree, there we go. So let's talk about Texas. I, this ACLU, I, I was gonna brief you uh, more about stuff that I've done, but I think that this is more appropriate for this particular audience. We're talking about Texas. An ACLU report came out last week. It's very encompassing. I wish, uh, I hope and pray that you guys all go read it in its entirety. I've read it twice. I'm probably gonna read it three or four more times. I'll put a copy in my bathroom. Uh, it's a great place to read stuff. This report has been a project of the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. The primary, uh, the, the primary authors, um, Keith Stewart talked to me yesterday. He's, he's, he knows uh, one or two of these guys that have helped put this together. They did, they did a phenomenal job of aggregating statistics and data to help us show some society's woes regarding cannabis prohibition. So I'm just taking a few elements of this out, just specifically around Texas. So let's talk about the two states. This is a scathing report by the ACLU. The two states with the most marijuana arrests are New York and Texas. 97% of those arrested were for marijuana possession only. Okay, that, those are people they're not dealing, they're not growing, you know, huge warehouses full of weed. These are people like you and me that are cannabis users that go home and we have to, we have to deal with the illicit market and somehow in between us using and getting our weed from the illicit market and going back and forth, we got arrested. 97% are for possession only. It's, it's amazing. Texas had the greatest increase Texas had the greatest increase in annual marijuana possession arrest between 2001 and 2000. In that 10 years, I gotta tell you, I came to DFW Normal in 2007. So for about five or six years, I gotta say I wasn't involved with this. And over the last three, three, four, five years, I have been, and ever since then, it's still getting worse. It's getting worse and worse and worse. I want you guys to realize this. It's getting better around the country. It's freaking getting worse here in Texas. We have to change this. It's getting worse. Texas is not getting better, it is getting worse. Remember that, it is not getting worse. New York is, only, is the only state that's ahead of Texas with 103,000 arrests. Okay, Texas is 74,286 arrests for marijuana. That's total arrests, not including, not, not, not just the 90% uh, that are possession. So the, the states that made the highest numbers of arrests for blacks for marijuana possession. I love that slide that you showed yesterday, it was incredible, thank you. I gotta steal that or make one myself. That was great. The states that made the highest number of arrests for blacks for marijuana possession in 2010 were New York, 40,000. Illinois, 29,000. Florida, Georgia. Let's get down to Texas, 19,000. 164. I say all those numbers because each one represents a person. 19,164. Graphics right out of the ACLU report, blacks are 2.3 times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana possession. It's amazing. 
And the cost is astronomical. I'll get into more of the cost here in a few moments. Let's talk about the arrests. I really find this reprehensible. Texas arrests, 19,164 were black, 52,893 were whites and everybody else because we don't separate everybody else. We don't separate Latinos, we don't separate Asians. It's whites and everybody else for 72,057 possession arrests in 2010 out of a total of 74,000 some odd arrests. So that's about 2,000 some odd people that were involved in something much greater than just simple possession, right? And the rest were, it's amazing. Texas is addicted to weed incarceration. Take a look at those numbers. 295 people per 100,000 incarcerated for just marijuana possession. I'm gonna tell you that the average rate for incarceration in, in, uh, over in European states is about 295. For everything, for everything. Okay, for everything, now we just, that's, golly, we are, and notice how I spelled marijuana. I spelled it like that because that's how the Texas State Legislature spells it in all of the, all, all of the legal documents that we have, M-A-R-I-H-U-A-N, it's not a misspelling. That's how we spell it in Texas. <laughs> yep. 126 million are spent on police. 126, I put all the zeros there, just so you can see them, because that's your money. That's your money. You live here in Texas, that's your money. It's, we pay high property taxes here in Texas. That's where it goes. 126 million for police, 85 million for courts, 40 million for corrections for a total of $251 million. And I'm gonna tell you, that's a very conservative low estimate. It's very conservative. Those are the baseline numbers, baseline numbers. I think if you were to dig a little bit farther, it's probably gonna be somewhere around $325 million, in my opinion. We're just going by their numbers right there. So this is the numbers I would talk to my legislator about, 251 million. We have better things to do with that money here in the state of Texas, don't we? Didn't we just fire a whole bunch of people in Dallas School District last year? And we have classrooms with 60 and 75 students per one teacher in Dallas, in Dallas County? You think they could use some of that money? I think they could. We gotta change that. That's what I hope to energize you folks here today because we began in DFW Normal several years ago. Just a couple of us got together and decided that we wanted to make a change here in Texas. And this is the last March that we just had here in Fort Worth. It's the first time we marched in Fort Worth. It's the Fort Worth Convention Center right down the street. I'm gonna tell you that you guys can make a change. We can all make a change. I'm gonna tell you that while this is such a scathing report, we have hope. And I'll, and I'll tell you, some of the elements of that hope are, three years ago I talked to my Texas State Legislature and he told me to get lost. The same Texas Legislature, same one, we're talking now. He's liking the idea. He's, he's seeing what's happening abroad, and this is a young Texas Republican, and he's not alone. It's not that they're afraid. It's that they need to be educated, and we need to help them do it. This legislative session is almost over. In two more years, there's going to be another one. What are we going to do between now and then? That's the key. We have to get up, and we have to get busy. And, and it begins here today, so that's why we're going to take prohibition by the horns, and we're going to get busy. After this is over with, please come to a DFW normal meeting. Please visit our website, dfwnormal.org. Please visit dpft.org. Please visit leap.cc and become a member. If, you don't, if you're not a member, please see me. I've got member pads over there. I'd love to be able to give you a free gift if you become a member. So please join us. Join the fray. You're here today. I'm preaching to the choir. God bless all of you people for coming here today and at least showing some interest and dedicating some time to the reform movement. God bless you for serving your country and making a change because we're going to start here in our community and we're going to we're going to go to our state, and then we're going to make a change in our whole country. We're going to make a change in our nation. God bless you guys for coming. Thank you very much.